I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Instead, let us turn to Ian Stevenson and see what he's got to tell us about other forms of evidence of survival. <coughs> so I'm going to talk uh, next about um, experiences near death. Uh, these are the experiences reported by people who come close to death and survive. I mentioned um, them briefly this morning, but I'm going to uh, narrate uh, to you uh, two cases that I consider rather unusual. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the, first, the subject of the first case uh, doesn't mind her name being used, uh, and she's called Peggy. And uh, she uh, had a, um, an embolus. Uh, There's a clot of blood that uh, broke off and uh, went to her lungs just after she had given birth to a, a baby. <coughs> <coughs> and she found herself up at the ceiling, looking down on a body of a woman who was on the floor of the hospital bed and uh, reflecting on this a bit, she discovered that it was her body. And there was then a, a great commotion of nurses running to and fro and um, of course she was picked up and put back to bed and recovered. Uh, what was unusual about her case is that uh, she remembered uh, conversations between her husband, who had been hurriedly sent for, and uh, the staff of the hospital. And um, she also remembered uh, her doctor at the nurse's station, some, um, I would say, 75 feet away, and the doctor was just being told that Peggy had died. And he said, uh, oh, that's terrible. She's such a good mother. And um, Peggy, after she recovered, uh, tried to tell the uh, doctors of the hospital about her experience. <coughs> it was a hospital as it happens in Virginia, where I am better known than I am in Illinois. And <laughs> the doctors whispered among themselves, wondering about her sanity and narrating this experience. And someone said, uh, well, we should report her to Dr. Stevenson. They'd evidently heard about me that far south in Virginia. Uh, but they didn't do that. And it was only many years later that she reported her case to me herself. <coughs> and um, I met her and, and reviewed her, her experience, which impressed me profoundly because of her ability to remember uh, conversations that she could not have heard normally. Mostly the patients who have these experiences uh, speak about uh, um, realms of, of which they could not have visited, uh, heavenly realms, you might say. It, from their uh, perspective, that's what they, they were and are. They've been there, they think, and um, they can't give any uh, further details, but Peggy did. So she is, uh, I think, an unusually memorable case. The second case I'd like to tell you about uh, occurred to a um, Hungarian who um, was living in Switzerland, where I met and interviewed him. Uh, he had managed to escape from the Russians when they invaded Hungary and I think it was 1956, and he uh, got to Switzerland where he was established himself successfully as a, an architect and city planner. 
He was uh, taking a trip with a friend to attend a football match. Um, it was quite some distance away, and the friend in a sports vehicle drove very rapidly. And then to avoid a chain of oncoming army vehicles in uh, what was obviously, or at least later obviously, a rather narrow road, he crashed. And my friend, as I may call him, Stefan, was thrown out of the car onto the pavement. And he was lying on the pavement and uh, the traffic, of course, halted. People got out of their cars and went over to look at the debris and uh, at uh, Stefan's inert body. <coughs> uh, he remembered later two of these spectators, you might say, and one of them was a man. He remembered them by listening to them from above, I should have said. Uh, one was a man who said, stupid fellow, reckless driver, just the sort, just the type who'd get involved in a crash, didn't know what he was doing, too bad for him. And then he walked off. The other memorable spectator was a woman who came over and looked at him and began to pray. And she had a little girl with her and the girl was tugging and wanted to leave. And this woman said, uh, no, no, we must stay and pray for him. We must pray for his soul. So she held the girl and, and prayed and, and then they left. And somehow uh, he, uh, my friend Stefan, had learned from above uh, the identities of these persons, their vehicles, and he was able to trace them. He traced the man and didn't say anything, just looked at him and came away. And then he traced the woman who uh, was the um, owner of a small business and the name of her business and the town where she lived in Italy was on the side of the vehicle, as many businesses have their, their name. And he traced her and sought her out. It was then some five years later uh, after the accident and uh, she introduced himself and without giving any details. He said, uh, do you remember an automobile accident of about five years ago? And she said, uh, no, I don't remember that. Well, he said, don't you remember that you got out and prayed for the person who had been killed? And she thought a little bit more and said, yes, that's right. I do remember that. And then he said, I'm that man. And they both wept. <laughs> That's the end of that case. <clears throat> I personally find it, it very moving. And uh, again, it has evidence of paranormal perception. I think that's about all I need to say or should say uh, about near-death experiences, except to just to mention briefly the cross-cultural differences in these experiences. In the Western experiences, the, the uh, person having the, the experience gives various reasons 
for uh, returning to life, uh, particularly the thought of children and sometimes um, the thought of the husband or the wife. And um, there's a certain voluntariness about the, the wish to return that implements the return itself. That's not the case in India, not often. If you ask the Indian who's had these experiences, ask them, they say, well, I don't know how I got up there, but I was just uh, digesting my supper and resting a little when I was snatched. And uh, we say, what do you mean you were snatched? Well, the Yamduts came for me and they took me to Yamraj. Well, in Indian mythology, the Yamduts are the messengers of um, Yamraj, who is the, the king of the dead. And these uh, Yamduts are really thugs. They're just like bouncers in a bar. Uh, they seize the victim and force him to go. <coughs> S uh, some of the uh, narrations by the patients are really quite uh, disturbing. Um, one uh, I cited just the last time I was in India, narrated being uh, dragged through th thistles and thorns on uh, their way to the place where their case was, this case was to be reviewed. Well, then they, they come to the point of reviewing. Now, some of the Western subjects say that they had a sort of screen run of their life, uh, a life review as we call it, sometimes referred to as panoramic memory, whereas all their deeds and misdeeds flash before them. That's not the way things are done in India. They have a figure called Chitragupta, and he has a book on you, and in that book are written all your deeds and misdeeds. So, first of all, they have to identify the, the person they have. So, Yamraj says, who have you got here? And they say, well, we brought uh, Jadav Singh, and then Yamraj said, look him up. And then they say, well, we can't find him here. There's been a mistake. What do you mean a mistake? You bungled? Send him back. So the Yamduts then take him back, and he wakes up where he was. That's a typical Indian story uh, of, uh, we have studied numerous cases of that kind in India. And Dr. Pazricu, whom I mentioned this morning, has uh, studied them um, meticulously. We have published some reports of them. Uh, but it's difficult sometimes for Westerners to think that beliefs can influence events uh, in these experiences so much. But it's true nevertheless, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Any comments or questions on that? Yes, I, I recently read a book or reread the book, uh, Return from Tomorrow by Dr. George Ritchie. And he is in Virginia. He died in 1946, was clinically dead when he was in the military down in Texas. And uh, he was taken, supposedly, by this consciousness through these different realms. And uh, when he returned, uh, the, the body was covered, and he recognized there was a hand with a ring, and that's where he went back into that particular body. And uh, some... Years later, uh, he was traveling through, I guess it was Mississippi, and 
he recognized the area where he had been taken, where a man had been coming out of a bar drunk. He uh, went unconscious, and there was a supposedly disincarnate entity trying to enter into this body that was unconscious. And I was just wondering, Dr. Ritchie, I believe, is in his late 80s and still living. Are you acquainted with his story? Yes, yes, that's the case of Dr. George Ritchie. He is still living, I hope so. I haven't seen him for a couple of years, but uh, that's, that's correct. You have a good memory. And um, Dr. Ritchie uh, wrote a book about his experiences, which is well worth reading. And uh, he did indeed um, recognize where he was because his body was covered and he recognized a uh, fraternity ring uh, and he thought, that's my ring, this must be my body, and he got into it. <laughs> lucky, lucky he didn't mistake our fraternity brothers. Uh, maybe so. All right, now let's, let's, uh, let, let's restrict these uh, especially to questions. Uh, I'm wondering in the case of the Indian, um, one of the Indian people who, who uh, was dragged through the thistles and the thorns, when he came back, was there evidence of scratches on his body or any, you know, was there actual evidence of being dragged or experiencing some type of wound from being dragged? Yes, uh, the question is whether the uh, Indian subjects have any um, marks on them after they come back. Uh, yes, uh, two or three of them have had uh, uh, burn marks and uh, other, other signs, but that's rather rare. But there are cases like that. Uh, I have a question about the cross-cultural differences. Um, you said that the Indian people would get up there and then be sent back. Were there any who actually had the experience of the life review like uh, Westerners have had? Well, the, the, uh, if I understand you correctly, the Indian life review is not conducted by the person himself. It's in the book. And uh, Chitra Gupta has this registry in which everything that you've done and, and should have done or not done is, is recorded, including, of course, your name. And we call these cases a bureaucratic bungling because they, <laughs> the Yamduts have taken the wrong person and they have to send him back. And that's the principal motive, uh, if you call that a motive for returning, that you hear from the Indian subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Just a second, we'll, we'll get you next. Okay. Is it on? Yes. Um, what conclusions have you drawn from your work, Dr. Stevenson, as a result of interviewing all these children as a result of the cases that you studied near death and, and uh, other phenomena. Uh, have you, do you come up, have you published any conclusions associated with this work? Uh, you mean, are you talking about all paranormal phenomena? Yes, yes. Uh, In other words, have you concluded that there is life after death? Uh, have you, you know, what, what kind of uh, conclusions, what kind of outcomes uh, would you point to that has resulted from all of the work that you've done in this area? Well, I think there's very strong evidence that there is life after death. Uh, that's as far as I'll go. Uh, not proof, but, but strong evidence. Just a second, we'll... Let's hold off there now. If belief system dictates the way they are, uh, the uh, experience is relived or experience is narrated to you, that would mean that people who really don't believe anything in life after death would never experience anything. I'm afraid I didn't understand. I she said that if belief systems uh, model or, or mold the experiences one has uh, in these after, uh, near death experiences and other such things, then someone who doesn't believe in life after death uh, would presumably have no such experiences. Do you have any comment about that? Is there any evidence on that? Yes, I think uh, there is evidence in that uh, 
some of these persons, uh, perhaps most of them, would say, um, well, I had a vague idea there was life after death, but it, I wasn't much impressed by uh, what I saw until this happened to me. And so personal experiences uh, it can be very moving. Doctor, I was just wondering, since your approach is scientific, could you just briefly describe to us, um, I'm assuming because you refer to we every now and then when you are talking about your information that you gather, could you explain to us how your scientific process works? Do you take just interviews from people and then go back and interview them maybe two or three later, years later to see if their stories are the same to verify your data? How, how is your process? How do you go about collecting this information. Could you briefly talk about that? Yes, yeah, surely. Well, we uh, interview uh, as many persons as we can, provided they are first-hand witnesses. We set aside uh, second-hand witnesses. And then we search out any relevant documents, such as post-mortem reports and death certificates. and. Um, we repeat the process of interviewing with, um, with, with persons uh, who are in a position to verify what the uh, recipient has said. For example, I interviewed Peggy Razzo's husband with regard to conversations that he had outside the door of her bedroom, uh, questioning whether she might, while well, perhaps still lying on the floor of the bedroom, have heard uh, what uh, her husband was saying outside. They were talking. Uh, they said they were talking. And uh, I had uh, at one time, and I guess I still have, but I couldn't put my hands on it, a slide showing Peggy's room. Uh, it was a uh, two-bed room. And across the uh, corridor, there was a, another patient who grumbled that there was a lot of noise going on in the hospital. And that was, of course, the commotion uh, created by uh, Peggy's uh, pulmonary embolus. Uh, but um, uh, we interviewed um, Peg Peggy's husband. And uh, I, th I think in that case, I looked over the, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't go to the hospital in that case, but uh, if there's, a terrain to be inspected, I uh, try to go there. Uh. Okay. Hi, doctor. A uh, quick question about Stefan that you had mentioned earlier. Um, you said that he was able to trace the identities and some, some means of identifying who the people were that witnessed his, uh, his accident. Can you go into detail a little bit as to how he was able to trace, how he was able to determine. Um, you had mentioned that the Italian woman, he found a name on the side of the car or on the truck. Uh, but did yes, he? Yes, well, it's in, uh, it's in southern Switzerland. And um, the name of the, of the town, they, there's a lot of uh, cross border traffic in that part of Europe. And so a, uh, an Italian tra traveling north into Switzerland uh, would very likely have the name and the city. Uh, so they had the name of the business. Uh, let's say in English it might be uh, Bellini Brothers and the city, Chicago, Illinois. Um, and then there would be in that part of Italy only a limited number of of people with that name. Uh, Stefan, I may say, uh, he quizzed the woman a bit and he allowed for the, um, the five year interval. He was uh, a really quite smart man. And uh, he said to her first, do you have a daughter? And she said, yes, I have a daughter. And he said, uh, is she about 12? And he said, yes, she is 12. And of course, he was adding on the five years from what he remembered as a seven-year-old girl who was tugging at her mother and wanted to leave without praying. 
So um, I, th that, I find that quite credible. I've forgotten what he said about tracing the man, but he had some, he was determined to confront that man, but in the end he didn't. I think he uh, uh, happily became overcome by uh, charity. And uh, he just looked at the man in the face and turned around and left without uh, confronting the man with his uh, ill-advised remark. I should have added that Stefan wasn't even driving the car, so uh, there was no point in vilifying him at all. It was, it was, the car was being driven by his friend. Uh, you had mentioned at one point offhandedly that uh, you were better known in Virginia than you were in Illinois, and you had also mentioned earlier that many times people uh, were discouraged about talking about their experiences, so perhaps there are an enormous number of experiences that are not shared, explained, or explored because of that uh, reluctance to expose belief or, or suggestion in paranormal. Uh, when you finally decide to um, discontinue your work and, and um, let just be done with it for now, would you be willing to suggest uh, perhaps you've set up a, a team of people to continue your work or people that might be referred to um, to send information or to be contacted for continued progression of your studies? Uh, yeah, well, we... Uh we have the, uh, more than the embryo, the fetus of a team. <laughs> I have a very able colleague uh, who has succeeded me as the director of our division. And I have um, colleagues, uh, I've got two somewhat younger. One is a, um, um, a woman, a lady, I should say, um, who walked into my office in 1978 and said, would you like a volunteer? And I said, well, maybe so, and what can you do? And anyway, to shorten the story, she uh, came on as a research assistant. And I, after a while, I said, look, I'm not physically immortal. You ought to continue your higher education. And so with some help, she uh, went to Edinburgh and became, earned a doctorate there. So she's there. And um, so we have, and I have Dr. Jim Tucker, who is a child psychiatrist. So there are three very able people. You call that a team? <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly the beginning, and they're good people. Yes, I was wondering uh, about the, uh, continuing the research. I was just wondering if there are any organizations out there now doing that. I know in uh, Virginia they had the ARE, Association for Research and Enlightenment. They were investigating some of the material that Edgar Casey had given on past life. And supposedly some documentation was developed where they related previous lives to people that we're living now went to cemeteries or whatever. But uh, I was just wondering if you're acquainted with that, sir. Yeah, I'm acquainted with that. And I, th I think it's uh, a pity that Edgar Cayce wasn't uh, investigated during his lifetime, but I don't think that's feasible now. It's too bad. Well, we seem to have run through uh, questions on this topic. Shall we go on to uh, uh, another? Okay. So, uh, if we follow this list, I'm going to talk about uh, possession. That is a situation in which a, a personality uh, seems to be dispossessed of his or her body and a new personality emerges. These cases are extremely rare, but I have known of several of them. And I'll just mention a couple of them uh, because uh, they both have impressed me 
uh, quite deeply. One is a case of Jazz Beer, a boy of northern India, who um, apparently died of uh, smallpox at the age of about uh, three. I don't think he was more than three. Uh, dates in Indian villages are often uncertain, and it's hard, one would be rash to claim precision, but uh, close enough is not more than three. But old enough to have developed certain habits and knowledge about uh, his situation. But he died uh, of smallpox, as I said, in the late evening. Now in India, you're not really a full person until you're an adult. So you don't earn cremation, as I'm talking now about the Hindus, not the Muslims. Uh, Hindus cremate bodies, uh, and they have great uh, gats, uh, as they're called, or their bodies are, are taken and burned, usually. Uh, the father of Jasbir, Jasbir's uncle, the brother of, the, of Jasbir's father, said to the father, look, it's too late to bury him, which is what they would ordinarily do with the child. Let's wait until uh, it's light, light in the morning and we'll, uh, we'll bury him properly then. So the father agreed to that, but he hadn't uh, overcome at all uh, his grief over the death of this child. And he stood or sat all night long by the body of the child. And then in the morning, as it was dawning, he thought he saw a little movement in the boy. And then the movement developed more and more and Jasbir became reanimated. Except it wasn't Jasbir. When he, it took him, of course, some weeks to recover fully, but when he did, he began saying that his name was Sobaram, and he belonged in Vahedi, another village. And furthermore, he was a Brahmin. He wasn't a Jat, like this family in which he found himself. And he rejected the family's food. Being a Brahmin, it was high caste, he wasn't supposed to eat the food of the low caste jats. Uh, they, they would be uh, roughly uh, just one notch above untouchables. So what to do? The father, in desperation, uh, engaged a kindly neighbor who cooked and uh, cooked Brahmin food that they fed to Jasbir. And he took that and gradually uh, uh, developed uh, normally as a child, except for his Brahmin attitudes. He was uh, what we call a Brahmin snob. Uh, we say that in India. Uh, he thought himself superior to other people. And um, when he grew up, he still had uh, a Brahmin attitudes and um, wouldn't last long in jobs that uh, would be appropriate uh, for uneducated people. Uh, he, uh, one of my associates in India, succeeded in getting him a good job, at, so it seemed, but after a while, Jasbir uh, quit. And when last uh, heard about, he was uh, unemployed. On the matter of food, uh, the family had uh, gradually adjusted to his demands and they were uh, giving him food that he ate. And he was uh, aware that it was chat food. So in that respect, he had made an adjustment. So that's one case. Uh, the other case I uh, studied much more recently, Jasper was Actually, uh, one of the cases I studied in the 1960s, and then with some follow-up. Uh, this uh, ca case I'm now going to describe occurred much more recently and is more complicated. Um, 
the subject is, uh, is, was, a young woman who had, um, I guess you'd have to say, uh, some kind of seizures or trances in which she seemed to become possessed uh, by, among other persons, uh, an Indian goddess at one stage. These would just last a few days and then pass off. And then uh, one day she said, well, I'm going to die, and predicted that X days from then she would die. And uh, the X days passed, and she became ill, and then she became weaker and weaker, and then uh, she ostensibly died. And they were getting ready to bury her. Um, she would have been buried, uh, according to the Indian, the Hindu customs. Um, oh, excuse me, she would have been uh, cremated. Uh, I said, I, I mis uh, misled you by saying they were putting her down. They, they put the body down of the dying person so that the person will die close to Mother India. But then later they'll take the body when they're sure about the death they will take the body and cremate it. But to go back to uh, Sumitra, that's her name, they were getting ready for her funeral, you might say. And I think they had actually uh, put her body down. At any rate, they were sure that she wasn't breathing. And then she became reanimated and she said that her name was Shiva, not Sumitra. And um, she said she came from a place called Dibiapur, and she'd been killed by her in-laws. Hit over the head with a brick. She gave enough detail so that it was possible to trace uh, a young woman called Shiva who had, according to the in-laws, committed suicide. Her body was found on the railway tracks. That's uh, distressingly common in, in India, railway accidents. And then uh, you can simulate suicide sometimes by putting a murdered body on the tracks uh, and then uh, alleging later that uh, it's been run over by a train. The mother of, uh, excuse me, the father of Shiva, who was a reasonably educated person, uh, uh, heard about Sumitra's change and went to see her, taking with him a photograph album. And Sumitra and the personality of Shiva then recognized all the people in the photographs. And then they took her to the place where the this family lived, and here again, she was able to recognize living people. Uh, her mother, that is Shiva's mother, uh, tried to hide in the house, and Shiva searched through the house and finally came to the presumably hidden mother and, and greeted her as her mother. That is... Uh, a powerful case, I think, because of the wealth of detail that um, the, the changed Sumitra gave about the life of, of Shiva. How, uh, how Shiva died, uh, no one will pr probably ever know. Uh, that she was killed seems uh, a possibility, however. Uh, and I, uh, last uh, tried to see Sumitra. It was uh, 1990, 1998 when um, Tom Schroeder was with me. Some of you might have heard of Tom Schroeder's book. But, uh, he is a, a prominent um, journalist in Washington, now one of the editors of the Washington Post. 
and he accompanied me on two field trips to Lebanon and, um, and India. Uh, when we got to Sumitra's village, which, by the way, is not an easy thing to do in the first place. It's a, in a very remote area of northern India. Sumitra wasn't there. Dr. Pazricha, who was with me, thought that she was in the house hiding and the family didn't want to bring her out. I don't know whether that's true or not, but we were unable to see Sumitra. And so I have no full follow-up uh, in her case. About 17. Unmarried. No, she was married and had had a child. Mm. Or I stun you all with that, that history. No questions. Yeah. Uh, did she ever return to Sumitra? Or you don't know? Is that what you're saying by the follow-up? Well, there was one account that uh, on one day there had been a reversal that Sumitra had come back and then gone again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure about that. I just and don't, don't and in the case of the little boy, how would you qualify, what makes you qualify that as a case of possession as opposed to potentially um, a three-year-old boy who, after a near-death experience, perhaps remembers a previous life and identifies with it? Well, uh, of course, uh, there are similarities, but um, the Shiva personality uh, was uh, vividly different from the um, Sumitra that the family had known. She, in fact, um, rejected them at first. She, uh, then she thought, well, I ought to look after this child as uh, Shiva's child. There's nobody to take care of him, so I'd better do that. And she, but she rejected her husband, that is, Sumitra's husband. But in the case of the three-year-old boy who had the smallpox and... Uh, Jasbir. Jasbir. And uh, you had reported that as a case of possession, but um, what if it was more... Uh, what makes you say possession as opposed to perhaps when he was reanimated, uh, he perhaps had a near-death experience and which helped him to remember a previous life which he perhaps identified with instead of being possessed by an, an alternate identity, perhaps he just remembered a previous life and identified with it from then on. What would make the difference? I think I need to think about that because uh, it, it is somewhat difficult. But uh, the, the new Jasper, let's say Jasper II, refused the family's food and um, just uh, rejected it. But uh, perhaps if, he, if his previous life he had been a Brahmin um, and he identified so much with this memory, he would, of course, reject it. Yes, you're quite right. That, that is indeed the case. And I, I was just thinking about another case in northern India, uh, not very far from uh, where Jasbir lives, uh, in which the subject uh, claimed to have been a, a Brahmin, and he made a terrible nuisance of himself by uh, his Brahmin snobbery. His, uh, his father was a lawyer, uh, but, but of the Kayas caste, and uh, the father, uh, very properly, I think, uh, made notes of his child's behavior and eventually uh, uh, went to the other city where the, his child said he he should he should be. What time do you want to break? Uh, so uh, a Jasbir case might might fit into that group. Yeah. 
Well, shall we, we uh, are, are, are we done on this topic? We yet? have a question from the webcast. All right. And this is again from Brian James from Atlanta. And he says that, I know that William Rawl, R-O-L-L, -L, professor of psychology, professor of psychology state um, at State University of West Virginia, West Georgia, has been cataloging a vast amount of near-death experiences. Have you had a chance to look over those, and have you seen, if you have, have you seen any amazing similarities or any vast differences in perspective of his work in comparison to your work? What's the name? William Rawl. Has he, published? Has he published anything? It doesn't say that he's published anything, but he's been uh, cataloging the near-death experiences via the American Society for Cyclical Research. Cyclical. Cyclical. I don't see how we can uh, make any comparison unless we, we can see data. Yeah. And if he hasn't published, then we've lost that opportunity. We have about 700 cases in our files and we grew gradually publishing reports about them. But, uh, you have to get something into print before it can be effectively uh, criticized. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll have one more, one more question, two more questions, and then we'll, we'll take a break. The lady in, in red. Um, I want to go back to the case of Jasmir. Uh, did your team research the the origin of the identity that Jasmir assumed or that that possessed Jasmir? Um, he said that he was this Brahmin from another town. And did y'all um, research whether that person had in fact existed? And if so, what did you find? Is my question clear? I didn't, I didn't were you able to, uh, in the case of Jazz Beard, were you able to find out anything about the, uh, the apparently possessing personality? In Jazz Beard's case? Yes. yes. Oh, yes, we went to the other village and interviewed uh, Sobo Ram's family and verified uh, the statement that uh, Sobo Ram had made. He uh, said he'd been... Uh, uh, coming back from a, a wedding and had fallen off a cart uh, and apparently uh, must have uh, fallen head first and uh, then died of brain injury. And um, but, uh, everything that Jasbir said uh, about Soboram uh, proved to be correct. Okay, so then in effect that would negate the possibility of Jasmir having had a near-death experience and remembered a previous life, all the evidence indicates that he actually was um, possessed by the personality of this other deceased person. Well, uh, yeah. if I understand you, you're agreeing with me to bracket this under the heading of possession. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I was partly responding to the question that the other person had as to whether it might have been an NDE. I think we need to move on to, to get it. Was there any, another question? One more. Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Hi, I was uh, going to ask a little bit more about Sumitra follow-up. Had her in-laws ever been interrogated or investigated to um, to determine if there was any culpability, or is it just that by by virtue of the train accident, they were they were cleared from any uh, responsibility for uh, the girl's death? Or is this you're talking about uh, Shiva? Shiva, Shiva yes. Sumitra, right? Um, yeah, they 
uh, Shiva's father brought a suit, but uh, 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 the, the family um, uh, said she'd committed suicide, and um, uh, Shiva's father uh, was, was dissatisfied with that. And uh, I'm not a forensic pathologist, but I must say that, um, I think it's unlikely that she uh, committed suicide. Her body was not in any way uh, mutilated. It, it just uh, was lying on the tracks. And uh, two, two trains had passed during the night. And they would surely, if they'd run over her, they would have mangled her. Or even if uh, they'd tossed her body uh, off the front, she would have been uh, badly mauled. So I think the father had a very good case. Uh, but of course, the law proceeds slowly, as you know, or should know. And uh, the case was still pending. Probably is still in the Indian courts. <laughs> Indian courts are just about like ours. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's take a little break now. If you all would come back in 10 minutes, we'll go on to dreams and mediumship. mediumship. <laughs> Thank you very much. The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. I'm going to talk next then about uh, mediumship and uh, illustrate it with uh, two or three cases that I consider valid. Uh, the first one is an exceedingly simple uh, but I think rather telling case of a, it goes back to the First World War. Um, among the effects, uh, now let me start over again. Um, a letter from a soldier killed in the trenches uh, to his family said, give my pearl tie pin to and then he named a, a girl uh, whom I intended to marry. And the family didn't know the girl and didn't have her address. So they were unable to do anything about a pearl tie pin. And not even that, but they didn't even know that he had a pearl tie pin. But eventually, And this uh, came through a, a medium. The address of this girl was given, and the officers, he was a, an infantry officer, his effects had been bundled up and shipped back to his family. And they found a pearl tie pin among them, and they gave it to this hitherto unknown girl. That's. Uh, a uh, fairly typical case of mediumship in which there was a communication of, of a fact uh, completely unknown to, to any living person, uh, except perhaps the, the girlfriend. But she was not aware that uh, her fiancé had a uh, pearl type in that he intended her to have. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a good case of, of mediumship in which the person believes that there has been a communication of uh, unknown facts, facts unknown to the people concerned with the sitting. I had nothing to do with that case. I pulled that out of published reports. But I did have something to do with the next case which is the case of, of uh, Runke Ronolfsson, a, uh, an Icelandic person. 
he um, manifested, you might say, at mediumistic sessions through a medium called Hafsten Bjornsson and uh, showed himself uh, rather a ruffian. Uh, he, first of all, uh, wanted snuff and tobacco and alcohol, all of which were unfamiliar to the medium. And then he complained about his leg and said he wanted his leg. And uh, the people attending the sitting knew nothing about the leg. He had first refused to give his name. Uh, I wouldn't say who he was. He said, it doesn't matter who I am, just find my leg. And this went on for, I think, uh, several years. And finally they said, well, we're not going to have any more to do with you unless you tell us who you were and uh, what you need. So he said, well, okay, I guess you have a point. So he then gave his name as Ronalfa Ronaldson. And um, from that, it was possible to look up records, old records, and identify uh, that such a person had existed. He had been on the coast in Iceland. Now, this goes back to the 1880s. And um, he visited with friends and drank too much. It was stormy weather, and his friends said, um, you shouldn't go home in weather like this. You better wait until the storm subsides. And he said, uh, no, I'll be all right. Don't worry about me. And he set off more drunk than sober, uh, trying to reach his home in this tempestuous weather. And uh, along the way, uh, sat down and took swigs from a bottle that he'd brought in in case of need and probably became more intoxicated and then went to sleep. And, and tidal water came in and washed his body out to sea. And then the body came back, uh, thrown up again by the ocean, was found and given a decent burial except for the femur, the the main leg, the main uh, bone of the leg. Uh, that was missing. And that was what the communicator wanted. He thought that he should have a, a full burial of his full body. And in fact, his body, they had been obliged to uh, bury his body without the, uh, the leg. So uh, this went on for some time. and. Finally, he said, uh, with regard to a, someone who had recently joined the group of sitters, uh, those of you not familiar with mediumship uh, perhaps should know that uh, the people attending a session or seance are called sitters. And uh, this uh, sitter group may vary in numbers. Um, they may increase or decrease there may be six or eight, or maybe just two or three persons participating. But uh, when a particular person uh, came and joined the sitters, then the communicator, uh, Roki as he became known, uh, showed particular interest and uh, said, he knows where my bone is. And the um, the sitter didn't know what he was talking about. And eventually they made further inquiries and the carpenter who had been uh, involved in the construction of this new sitter's new home said, uh, open up this wall, indicating a wall in the house. And so they ripped off the 
covering of the wall and found a femur, a bone, that had obviously been um, chewed up by, uh, by fish and perhaps by dogs on the shore. But it was the bone of a tall person, and uh, Rookie had, was tall. It, 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 it didn't have any signature on it, but it was a known uh, that these, this man had been buried without his bone, and uh, it was concluded that the bone that had been put in the wall uh, was probably the missing femur. The, uh, the story of Runke uh, continues uh, in a happy way because he became um, mollified when his bone was duly buried uh, with the proper ceremony. And um, he changed his habits. He gave up uh, tobacco and alcohol and snuff and uh, he ended up, you might say, at least uh, Hafston Bernson has since died, but he ended up as the principal communicator through Hafston. So uh, this is a case of um, personality improvement uh, in purgatory and later, probably improved through the uh, Good, good models provided by the sitters. That's the end of the story of Rookie. Well, uh, shall I tell one dream story? Do you want any questions? Uh, I didn't see any, were there? Any questions? Oh, sorry. I think we weren't quite sure. We have a question over here. Just a second. We'll get the. We have to get electrified. All right. All right. Uh, some of the stories you gave. It was a girl that was possessed by a girl. Boy was possessed by a boy. And I don't remember Edgar Casey's ever having a lifetime that he reported other than as a man. So is this always true? that you don't reincarnate as a different uh, sex? No, not if you uh, accept the evidence of the cases. There are many cases of what we call the sex change type, especially in Burma, uh, Myanmar, as it's now called. Uh, one of the uh, first cases I studied uh, in um, Sri Lanka was of the sex change case, the sex change type, I mean. And she remembered the previous life of a boy who'd been a girlish boy and who talked about rebirth, as Buddhists often do, and uh, speculated that, even expressed half-heartedly the wish that if he were to reincarnate, uh, he would be a boy. Oh, sorry, he would be a girl. And um, this child, uh, Nana Tilika, was uh, quite boyish in her habits and attitudes. Her story isn't, uh, her case isn't finished. I have an assistant in Sri Lanka who has got the um, marvelous habit of following some of these cases into adulthood and there are stories to tell about that, but I'll, I'll just mention that Nana Tilika um, was a, seemed like a model case in the clarity of her memories, but she later married a Christian clergyman who told her that this talk about rebirth was a lot of nonsense and she, she should give it all up. And apparently she became converted by him and, as it were, withdrew everything that she'd said as a child. But of course, you can't do that if you've said something when you're three or four and somebody's made a note of it. And her case was well investigated when she was young. 
And you can't later say, I didn't say that. You, you can say, I don't believe it anymore, but you can't say, I didn't say this. A question. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was wondering about the differentiation between channeling and mediumship. Are they similar? And then scientifically, uh, I've read where they said, well, this is nothing more than multiple personality that a person has. Uh, that's how they defined it. And uh, I was just wondering if there is a major differentiation between, because there seems to be a proliferation of channeling in our society today. Are okay, they thank you. I think we've got the question. Okay. Uh, yes, there does seem to be such, uh, but the only um, difference uh, that I would draw is that between those instances where some verifiable statement is made and in uh, most of the uh, channeling experiences, that doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Along those same lines, in all the forms of evidence that you have um, broached with us uh, over this discussion, um, I, I'm sure you've gotten pretty, pretty uh, expert at discerning whether something is, has been worth your time or whether there's a veracity to a particular person's story, whether it's through mediumship or uh, near-death experience. And I'm sure the percentages are smaller rather than larger that there will be a case with strong evidence that you can um, put, file and, and put away as documentation. Is there one for, is there one form or other that is more often um, coming through with um, a larger percentage of usable cases? Uh, this might be too confusing, but... Um, you mean well, uh, of like, the various kinds of Of evidence? the various kinds, like mediumship versus possession versus near-death experience versus uh, apparitions. Um, what are the percentages of usable versus non-usable um, is there one that has a much greater percentage of usable cases in what, each? What are the best cases? Uh, from what kind of evidence do you get the best cases? Are the, the ones you talked about? Best usable cases. Uh, I find that difficult to answer. Mm. Uh, some of the apparitional cases are quite impressive, and so are uh, some uh, of the children who speak about past lives. I think I'd put those two in the lead. What about the least? The, mo the most difficult to qualify as usable, in, as the opposite extreme. Uh, Is there one that would come down ranking lower, more difficult to use, or prove? Well, I, yes, I think mediumship cases are going to be very tricky, and it's... Uh, it's unusual to find a, um, a person who really is talented and is willing to submit themselves to people like myself and be investigated. Now we have, there's a, a Polish engineer, uh, Stefan Ossiowiecki, who was remarkably gifted uh, in clairvoyance um, we, I, I and two co-authors have a book coming out about him. But he's so unusual, he was. He was killed by the Germans in 1944. And he was, um, had a beautiful character. But these people are so rare, very rare. I, I have a, a question from our virtual audience, from Joseph Kozenzak uh, in Chicago. And he would like to ask, have you ever, have you ever attended a seance? And if so, what was your impression of it? Yes, I've attended seances, but uh, none, none that I've attended has been impressive to me. But uh, so my conviction that some are valid and uh, noteworthy and convey evidence of life after death uh, um, rests on published reports written by people in whom I have confidence. Okay, a couple of more questions and then we'll need to move on to the next topic. Yes, I'm uh, interested in knowing if you encountered any cases where the possessing entity spoke a language entirely different from the, the person being possessed. 
either a medium or, or an actual case of possession? Uh, an, an unlearned language? Yes, one that they'd never known before. Yes, the, whereas the, the medium would not know the language yeah. that the entity was speaking. Yes, I, I published uh, several cases of that kind, but they're very rare. In one case, the language was Swedish. In the other one, in the second one, it was German. And in the third, it was Bengali. Uh, these, are, these are very difficult. They're very rare cases. And they're difficult to investigate. Yeah. I'm just curious, in all your research, have you ever encountered any extraterrestrial, whatever? No. no. OK, thank you. Uh, one last question, and then we'll go on to the next topic. Uh, I'd like to go back to the femur. I, I find it interesting that this discarnate was so obsessed with his body in the in that state, and I would have thought he would have just been glad to get rid of it. And in a sense, he was still attached to his own body, even though he was on the other side. Could you comment on that? That's true. It was, uh, he was, I would say, abnormally attached. But, um, I can't say I've investigated this matter thoroughly. <laughs> but I do believe that uh, more people than we realize are attached to physical features. And, uh, and especially, I think, in a profoundly Christian community such as the Lutherans of Iceland are, uh, it's very important to be fully buried uh, entirely. How do you get resurrected otherwise? <laughs> well, that may have a bearing on it. Yeah. Okay, shall we go on to dreams then? Uh, uh, dreams that contain anything paranormal are frequently reported, but uh, ones of value are, seem to me to be very rare. Uh, this one, or rather a series of dreams, occurred to a colleague of mine uh, at the University of Virginia. I won't identify him f further. But he had a series of dreams some years after his father's death in which his father seemed to be coming out of his coffin and walking toward him. He had uh, several of these dreams over a period of some weeks uh, he would writhe on the floor of his bedroom and uh, his wife would say uh, oh, he, he was on the floor partly because of uh, some um, ailment in his back, but uh, he would be uh, ordinarily sleeping peacefully, but he was observed by his wife to be moaning and groaning and writhing and tossing around on the floor. So she asked him, um, what, what's the trouble? Why are you doing this? And Oh, he put her off and didn't say anything about the dreams. And then, <clears throat> here I have to fill in background. Uh, this family are uh, Christians, ultimately um, through Kenya, or Kenya. Uh, they are Roman Catholics of Goa. For those of you who remember your history of the, the European colonies will know that Portugal for a long time uh, controlled Goa, which was, uh, after independence, was taken over by India. So the letter came uh, from the, uh, the subject's sister-in-law to his wife, and she was saying in the letter, she said, uh, what about, what about the bones? Have you paid what's needed for the proper 
disposal of the bones. So this reference to bones had to do with the fact that in Goa, on the, in the Roman Catholic Church, you had the use of the cemetery for uh, X number of years, I think it's three years. And after that, uh, your bones are dug up and you have two choices. One is, well, you have three choices. One is to do nothing. Uh, another is to have the bones put into a well. And the third is to have them set in the wall of the cemetery in a niche, and then you can have a tablet describing the uh, relevant data of the deceased. And that's uh, a, a treasured memorial. So, uh, my colleague's wife had paid up uh, for the transfer of the bones. And uh, when this letter from her sister-in-law uh, came, she ignored it. Uh, meanwhile, my colleague was writhing on the floor, groaning. But when the letter came and uh, he could see there was some concern back in Goa about um, the uh, proper uh, burial of the, of the body, he then told his family about his dreams and urged his wife, he didn't go himself, uh, he probably thought he couldn't leave his uh, work so he urged his wife to go back to India and attend to this matter. And that went on until the, the dreams stopped. And she uh, had agreed to go and uh, the dreams ended. And that's, uh, it, for me there is some evidence of a paranormal communication from the father to the son about the matter of the bones. They were on the, the verge of being discarded. His wife uh, was sure she'd paid the priest to attend to everything, including the three-year ceremony. And the priest, in effect, was saying, no, you haven't paid anything, everything, just send us X rupees and that'll settle the matter. So that's one of the few instances where I think paranormal uh, information has been communicated in dreams. Uh, any, uh, any questions about dreams? We have one in the back. And we'll come back to this one. Doctor, has it ever been the case that um, someone has died and then visited a family member immediately after the expiration of that person in your research? Because it's occurred in my family. And I've heard other instances just in passing where uh, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, for instance, visited my sister, and news wasn't known yet that she had actually expired. Um, and I found that this is somewhat common, and I'm wondering if any of your research reflects or sheds light on that issue. Well, not, not shedding much light, but we have certainly heard of such cases um, in which a... Um, in fact, I mentioned this morning a case of uh, the man called Will, who uh, <coughs> manifested to a dying woman, and none of the people around her had ever heard of Will, although Will was uh, living in another continent and uh, unknown to the immediate members of the dying person's family. And the, the, the interval there was just a few days when uh, that was looked into. Okay. We have, I think, a, a web question. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yes, to get our website, you have to go to the University of Virginia, and then you go to the, um, um, I see I'm so technologically backward, I, you'd have to uh, go to the Division of Personality Studies, which is part of the Department of Psychiatric Medicine. So you've got three steps to go through, but you can get there. And uh, we have a, a, an excellent research assistant who answers the mail first, usually, and is very good. This is a question from Alan Katzoff from Boston, and it's about how many cases of mediumship do you have on file that you or your associates have verified regarding the accuracy of the statements? And of those that were verified, what was your process of verification? We don't have uh, abundant files uh, of mediumship. It's not been a major feature of our endeavors. And uh, I don't think that I could say that I personally, I did participate to some extent in the, in the case of Runke, but um, we, we don't have a, a box full, let alone a cabinet full of um, verified cases through mediumship. Uh, I think it's a subject that it should be taken up, uh, and I hope it will be uh, more earnestly. In the uh, early, um, the first half of the 20th century, mediumship was popular among investigators. But the present generation of investigators have shown little interest in it, which I think is regrettable. Uh, I'm handicapped to have an engineering training, but uh, what we've been talking about is one-to-one -one correspondence, one incarnation to one body, or one body being an opening for other incarnations. Have you ever come across where there's one body that has two incarnations or more? Say, you know, I know that some multiple personalities have maybe five pair of glasses and they're all different. Uh, I was just wondering if, if, if you've come across that sort of thing. No, we, uh, I have come across um, uh, instances in which um, subject um, well, there may be uh, two or even three or four candidates to have been the same person. This occurs particularly among the um, tribes in Northwest North America, such as the Clinket. It also occurs in parts of West Africa, uh, say among the Igbo. And um, they certainly uh, pose difficulties uh, for the investigator. The uh, person whose life is allegedly remembered by these several persons is nearly always a notable person. And uh, so there would be uh, some prestige uh, attached to uh, verified memories of that person's life. It might be, a, say, a, a chief, a uh, tribal leader, or otherwise notable. I have two questions um, on the topic of re mediumship research. Are you familiar with the research of Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona, the afterlife experiments? Yes, uh, yes I am. And I'm curious about your, your um, assessment of his research on mediums. Well, I'm disappointed in his book because uh, he hadn't, I thought, uh, adequately excluded um, alternative explanations 
such as um, clairvoyance. And I think uh, his, um, uh, I think he had some, or has, uh, knowledge of some people who probably are gifted clairvoyance, but he hasn't yet, uh, to me, and I think I could say to my colleagues, he hasn't provided um, evidence of animation in the communicators. Mm -hmm. I think that's a feature you'd have to, you, you want to look for. You don't want just an inventory of uh, Aunt Gertrude's possessions and hobbies. You need to sense that there's some, some uh, animating personality behind the communications. Mm -hmm. At least that's one of my criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And it's if you good. had unlimited funds and could design any kind of research um, for the future into the areas that you're interested in, what kind of research would you, would you like to see pursued? I guess I haven't got her question. She said, if you had unlimited funds and could design any kind of research you would like, what kind of research would you like to design into these questions? Well, I think um, I would, uh, uh, how much money do I have? <laughs> unlimited. Anyway, I, I think I'd pour it into the um, cases with birth defects and birth marks or skin anomalies. And um, especially um, where we could obtain postmortem reports. Uh, if it's, if I'm correct in thinking that some birthmarks derive from previous lives and some birth defects also. I think that's important uh, information for physicians. I think medical people should know that that's a possibility uh, as a cause of birth defects. Parents, uh, at least in the, in the West, uh, are very troubled if the uh, baby isn't normal and uh, they search for some explanation. One of their first questions, or one of the mother's first questions is, is the baby normal? And um, birth defects are a, a saddening feature of many uh, births that should otherwise be happy. But um, it's, you might be surprised to know how common birth defects are and how little is known about their causes. Some can be attributed to uh, genetic factors, but um, for most, uh, the um, pediatrician just has to shake his head. He doesn't know. Thank you. Y you, um, I, I think that the majority of your work, which hasn't been what you talked about so much today, is on um, children, who are recalling past lives. And I'm, I'm asking you, about how many cases are there now of children who are recalling past lives in which you feel that the evidence is extremely strong, that they're conveying something that they had no other way of knowing, that you were able to somehow validate because it is either from another village that you were able to go to or from something historical. But how many of these really, um, what you would say the really hard cases are there? 35. And, and do you have them in one place, in one chart that really um, describes their features? When, where is the place to go for those 35? Where are they? Yeah. Where are the reports on them? Yeah. Uh, we haven't reported all of them uh, by any means, but uh, my uh, young colleague Jim Tucker, whom I mentioned and cannot sufficiently praise, is 
uh, uh, writing a paper on what we call the B cases. Now, B case are those in which a written record was made before there was any verification. And B stands for before. And so B cases are much rarer than A cases, where the two families have met and they've mingled their memories. And it's very difficult then to know precisely what the child said uh, because of the possibility of contamination uh, between the families. So these B cases are precious and they're unfortunately rare. But as I said, we have some 35 on file now. And um, I'm hoping that um, Dr. Tucker will uh, write a paper about them. I just guess you have to follow up. Are, they, are they mainly in India? Are they mostly in India or, or are they all over? Well, all over is a very strong phrase. <laughs> but they're, uh, well, the first one I encountered, the very first one, I, I showed a slide of him, Metsimad Dilawar. Um, it was from Lebanon. And um, I think, um, you know, I think most would, ha would be, uh, from uh, from India, probably. Uh, one trouble we have is that uh, parents uh, become curious and they um, try to solve the case. We use the word solve uh, to mean that the, the child statements were verified. And they try to solve the case on their own instead of coming to us first. And um, that happens so often, in, uh, especially in Sri Lanka. I wish I had all the time back that I spent in Sri Lanka trying to uh, pursue uh, the children, the, the, the person about whom the child in Sri Lanka is speaking, because they don't, they're like American children, something that they don't give enough verifiable details. So uh, we don't have many of these. Uh, B cases in, in, in uh, Sri Lanka. I guess uh, one of the things Dr. Tucker will uh, certainly describe, but I think most of them probably are from uh, India. That we may have um, a few from uh, a few from Myanmar, and um, Myanmar is a, a great place for sex change cases, but not for uh, not for the kind of, of B case that uh, we would like to see more often. But Thailand has interesting cases. The um, I, uh, if I still have money left, I'd uh, I think I'd um, I'd probably do more or have more work done in um, Myanmar. There are fascinating cases in Myanmar of uh, children who say they were Japanese soldiers killed during World War II. And they are loaded with Japanese trays. Uh, they grumble about the climate. They don't like the food, it's too spicy. Uh, they uh, have a tendency to violence and are often cruel to their playmates. They slap faces, uh, the playmates now. The Japanese soldiers, if were, they were annoyed by a villager, they would get their uh, faces slapped. It was a Japanese uh, discipline, that totally unknown among Burmese people. But these children I'm talking about will do this with their playmates. Uh, so uh, more money should be spent on them With respect to the, uh, the number of cases, one might remember uh, a saying of William James, to prove that not all crows are black, it is necessary to find only one white crow. 
Uh, my original question had to do with mediumship, but as a follow-up to this last question, um, I believe it's in the book Old Souls by Tom Schroeder. He made reference to the fact that the number of cases in the West are very small, perhaps by, for cultural reasons. People don't talk about it. People, you know, try to ignore what the child is saying. But he also said that, um, or if I recall correctly, he said that there were more and more cases popping up, but nobody was currently... Um, researching them, and I was wondering if since he wrote that book, there has been somebody who has been designated to following up on Western cases in the United States. Well, yes, that's Dr. Jim Tucker. Oh. He's doing that. I took Tom Schroeder to an American case, mm -hmm. a rather interesting case. Described um, in that book. It's actually in Virginia. We have more Virginia cases, perhaps because I'm better known there than elsewhere. <laughs> I don't, think it's, I don't think there's anything in the climate of Virginia that <laughs> generates cases. But um, with respect to the mediumship, I was just wondering if you, in, in the few cases that you seem to um, have perhaps cataloged or have personal exposure with, did anyone discuss with the medium themselves what happens to them during a case of um, channeling? What happens to the medium's personality? Do, do, do they remember it? Do they notice themselves apart? Or are they watching it? Or what happens to the medium as a person, personality? Well, they've been, yes, they've been uh, subjected to numerous inquiries of that sort. Uh, most of them uh, during the um, communications are out of touch. They're in what we would call a trance state and they would they claim or state later that they don't remember anything of what went on uh, between the lights going off and coming back on again. Uh, they're just totally uh, amnesic for that. I, I can't now think of any medium who has claimed to be aware of the, the goings on in the session while they were ostensibly entranced. I have a femur question. Um, <laughs> I, I keep wondering, how did the femur get in the wall? I'm very curious, I'm sorry. How did the femur end up in the wall? Did, did someone? The, the, the question's clear. <clears throat> How did what? How did the femur end up in the wall from the story of the, uh, uh, the fellow who was so concerned about getting his leg I think buried? It was, it was just in the way of the builder, and he uh, thought, it doesn't, we don't know who this belongs to, and we've got to get rid of it somehow. I'll just put it here, and he built it into the wall. There was, there was nothing deliberately sacrilegious about that. Well, we have a question here, and I also have a question. This is from a um, Eulalia uh, Diaz in Miami, Florida. And she is relating an experience she had with a question at the end. I was once taking peacefully a shower at home and washing my hair with my eyes closed when a big comb I had placed on the border of the tub suddenly fell inside, making a particularly flat, loud sound, which scared me badly. I felt panic, and in fractions of a second, I felt a very loud, uh, strong electric shock going through my spine, like a flash, accompanied by a sudden vision of being beheaded. I actually saw my head falling off and the spilling of the blood, to my horror. Never before had I thought, seen, or felt anything like this. This was the most shocking experience I've ever had, remem remembering something that seemed to belong to a previous incarnation, as it did not relate to anything otherwise known to me. I shall mention that in my present lifetime, I have always suffered a persistent neck pain. Uh, 
that has even required chiropractic treatment in that area on several occasions. Could this neck pain be traced back to a possible incarnation and beheading, according to your findings in other cases? It could be, but uh, that's all you could say, I think. Uh, if she had, uh, as we sometimes have, um, some uh, skin anomaly in that area, in the skin area, that would be uh, impressive. And we do have such a, a case. It was, this, this, the subject is one of these um, uh, Japanese soldier cases that I mentioned. Uh, he was, when the British finally re retook Burma at the end of the Second World War, uh, he found himself in Rangoon. Uh, and the British occupied Rangoon in May of 1945. They had, that was the end of the reconquest from the Japanese. So the Japanese uh, quite often killed prisoners. Uh, they especially killed pilots, but they, uh, they killed prisoners. And this um, subject uh, said, he thought in the previous life, that the British would surely kill him. So instead of uh, allowing that to happen, he committed suicide and uh, slit his throat. And he has, and uh, I have an illustration of him uh, the book, he has a remarkable uh, scar about, I call it a scar, I'm, that's sort of jumping ahead of the facts, it's a, a, a skin anomaly right across his neck. It's about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, five millimeters uh, wide and maybe uh, 20 uh, from one side to the other. I had a, um, a question, this isn't from the webcast, but you talked about so-called sex change uh, cases, which of course here has a particular connotation, but I wondered if you think that the cases that you have um, dealt with in, in this regard shed any life, light on homosexuality in this life. Yes, I think they. I think they may. I think they may. But uh, I wouldn't want to say that that's all there is to homosexuality. On the other hand, um, I think um, parents have been unjustly blamed for uh, developing homosexuality in their children. And I had. I've had two. Uh, teenage children who asked to consult with me, and they both had been uh, subject to what I call psychiatric abuse. That is to say, they had been exonerated, but the parents had been blamed. And the father, um, his life had been made miserable by the, the thought that uh, somehow or other he had trained his child to be uh, a boy. I'm sure that was that was wrong. These children, they didn't have any uh, any memories. They didn't claim previous lives, but they uh, they claimed that the psychiatrist had got it all wrong. <laughs> well, I think we're about at the end of uh, of the afternoon. I want to thank uh, first of all and ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Ian Stevenson for his presentation. <laughs> And then we want to thank all of you for being here. And I want to close with a little quotation from the English playwright J.B. Priestley, who once remarked that all of us are living a fairy tale of our own creation. I hope yours ends with a you catastrophe. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>